Thank you everyone for joining us today and um, uh, with our, our guest who has uh, graciously agreed to come and speak with us, uh, James Ishmael Ford. Uh, my name is Jeff O'Keefe. I'm the executive director of Zen Peacemakers International. And, uh, and uh, once again, I, I, I appreciate you uh, joining us today. Uh, be before I uh, introduce and hand over to James, I just wanted to make one schedule uh, announcement. Uh, next Friday, a week from tomorrow, which I believe is November 4, uh, we're uh, uh, in the same format. We're offering the fourth in a series of four sessions that we've been doing memorializing Bernie Glassman. And um, the first was uh, uh, Bernie and Street Retreats, Bernie the Entrepreneur. Um, last week uh, we, uh, we talked about uh, Bernie's commitment to interfaith practice and activity. And next Friday uh, we will focus on Bernie at Auschwitz. And uh, the, the, the videos of the first three sessions are available on our website, should you be interested. So uh, please feel free to and, and avail yourself of, of those. But join us next week if you'd like. It's at a, um, 1, 1 p.m. New York time next Friday. So, and it's free to everyone. So you just need to go in and register. So uh, that's, that's enough of my organizational stuff. And uh, uh, James and I uh, just had an enjoyable little bit of time chatting and, uh, ch and sharing uh, just for the last few minutes. And uh, I'm sure he will tell you, but I think he's got, he's got a bit of a cold. So we'll, we'll uh, bring your healing thoughts to this as well and uh, send him some, some energy. So uh, James is going to share with us uh, the title of his talk today is Zen in Liminal, Liminal Times. And I'll let him talk to you about, you know, what, what, what he intends. And, and I will uh, mute myself here. And James, I'll, uh, I'll let you unmute and I'll pass you the microphone. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, uh, hi, everybody. Um, um, yes, I do have a, 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 a well, f four days ago, I thought I had allergies. Uh, uh, then I took a COVID test and then I realized I had some sort of upper respiratory thing. And I've taken another COVID test and uh, uh, um, um <clears throat> Uh, mainly, I, I I don't have much of a brain, so I'm not too worried about that part. But but I'm hoping my 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 voice will will last. Uh, what what I my 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 hope for the for for our time together today is is I have a paper. It's rewritten out of a presentation I did from uh, for the Society for Christian Buddhist Studies uh, a, a while back. Um, kind of updated and thought about a little bit, but it 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 turns on the liminal of where Zen meets liberal religion, which is not often considered. And I'll unpack what that means in the presentation. My my interest in in the last year or so has been more focused on on Buddhist Christian uh, um, dialogue but but um, I think th this is uh, more to who I am and also I think opens up the question that if 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 Zen is something that's accessible across religious traditions um, what is that that's accessible uh, across religious traditions and and I, 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 I I'm trying to poke that a little bit uh, um, in the, in this presentation and out of that and that's I'd, I I haven't timed it but I, I think it's pushing about 20 minutes um, out of that I'm hoping there's a conversation uh, I'm I'm actually trying to figure things out uh, uh, and so maybe we can all kind of try and figure things out together a little bit let's see uh, um, for those who are interested, the panel I was on um, was uh, led by Thomas Katoy, um, uh, Dwayne uh, Bidwell, uh, Ruben Abito, uh, Miriam Levering were were my co-panelists, and then Catherine Cornell um, um, was that the respondent that these kind of academic things do. And uh, 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 I will come back to to 
to to that and them after I uh, uh, after I finished the the the, the sharing the, the my my thoughts. Um, it's always good to start with a story. Uh, I was in Connecticut to co-lead a Zen retreat. Uh, as the retreat ended, one of my co-leaders, Mary Gates, who is both a fully authorized Zen teacher and an Episcopal priest, uh, excused herself. Uh, Mary explained she had to say mass for the small congregation she served as vicar. Uh, being me, uh, I asked if I could tag along. The service uh, was held in a tiny stone chapel in West Cornwall. Uh, the town is a Norman Rockwell image of old New England. It even has a covered bridge. Uh, the chapel, uh, well, maybe it was built in New England. Possibly it was picked up and moved from some bucolic English countryside scene. Um, picture perfect. Uh, there were 18 of us in that little chapel, and we pretty much filled it. The service itself was prayer book right two, with all that means for those familiar with the history of Episcopalian religious services. Uh, for me, as a social progressive, it's filled with awkward masculine by preference language. And as a Buddhist, with full-on dualistic God out there and you and me down here theologies. Not my cup of tea. And first, there were the people. Uh, I can't read hearts with any clarity, certainly not by outward appearances, but it felt the full range of who we are as we come to church on intimate display. Young people, maybe they're on their own, just as likely to be making family happy. Older people, some quite elderly, uh, where the actions of the pews came from decades of practice. Uh, possibly done out of rote, but you know, it looked more like well-traveled paths towards something. I'll return to that. And a fair number in between. Some probably happy to have a service that ends early in the morning. Others, well, hard to say. Uh, a large basket of life. Although it sure felt most everyone was fully present as they were. Sadness, hope, longing, joy. You know, the human things. The things that we call religious, or perhaps today we might prefer to say spiritual. And here we are today in this little gathering. Not, I suspect, all that different. <clears throat> and, you know, I really am honored to be invited to pause and reflect. Uh, and from that, to share my journey uh, between the great spiritual tra traditions of East and West. Uh, um, it's been useful to me, and I hope it may prove of use to you, and I'm certainly learning, looking forward to learning what you have to say. Uh, I walk a path between. Um, of course, for each of us, what between looks like is going to be a bit different. For many years, I've spoken of my physiology of faith. Uh, it was alluded to in the advertising for this gathering. I adapted it from an anecdote they tell about the Renaissance philosopher and Catholic priest Erasmus, Didymus Erasmus. One Friday, some friends came upon him eating a sausage. Uh, when chided, he replied that while he did indeed have a Catholic heart, alas, he had a Lutheran stomach. Uh, I get it. Uh, I like to say I have a Buddhist brain, a Christian heart, and a rationalist stomach. That is, that while I find the basic Buddhist analysis that I, not while, I find the basic Buddhist analysis maps the world I've experienced and points me on in critical ways. Specifically, I find the assertions that there is nothing permanent, that there is no abiding substance, that everything compounded exists in a tension that we as human beings experience as hurt or anxiety or suffering and that there is a saving wisdom that puts things to peace. I find these axiomatic, simply how I understand the world and everything in it. However, the content of my dreams comes out of my natal tradition, Christianity. I learned to read out of a King James Bible resting on my grandmother's lap. So, 
My dream world looks a lot like the Near East and is populated by Moses and Jesus, by Miriam and the Marys. I know them. They know me. And it is all of it tied together through an essentially rationalist disposition. In my years as a Unitarian Universalist minister, when encountering people described, uh, people from our hard atheistic, self-described humanist wing, I would like to say, I'm more rational than you. Uh, and, you know, usually I was right. Uh, so, a bit of a mess. And maybe a mess some of you recognize. In trying to sort out what that means for me, I find myself thinking, of how not all that long ago, a Catholic priest and I exchanged messages about our shared interest in Zen. He had formally completed Zen koan training and was authorized to teach within the Sanbo Zen lineage. Um, Sanbo Zen, you know, we're all here from different things. We're in the, the orbit of, of the white plum, but I know that you're not all, all white plum people, but so Sanbo Zen, is a lay organization that arose at the beginning of the 20th century and while rooted in the Soto tradition transmits a Rinzai influenced koan meditation practice. Um, uh, uh, the founder of the White Plum, Mayazumi Roshi, uh, um, completed that form, that training himself and uh, um, um, received transmission in that line. Uh, uh, um, the, 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 curriculum that's transmitted within the white plum is slightly modified by uh, uh, um, his additional lineage connection in the Rinzai tradition then and, and there's minor minor modifications but it actually is essentially the same same Cohen lineage and it's my Cohen lineage as well so uh, that <clears throat> now masters of Cohen practice are by definition Zen masters so this Catholic priest, like my friend, the Episcopal priest, was a Zen master. Um, me, I'm a dually credentialed as well, a Soto Zen Buddhist priest, uh, as well as a Unitarian Universalist minister. Um, I also have a, a, a my actual uh, koan practice is not in that Soto line, but so there's, you know, three, three traditions, you know, uh, most of us are mongrels uh, in the West. Um, um, we, we all, we occupy a liminal space between uh, uh, something and something else, you know, between uh, the path between. Um, it, I guess it shouldn't have surprised me when out of the blue, this Catholic priest says, so what's your theology? Uh, theology, uh, uh, I noticed, not uh, what you believe. Uh, to that question, in that moment, without actually thinking about it, I said, I'm a liberal Buddhist. When I do think about it, I normally try to avoid liberal. Uh, it's such a freighted term in our time and place. And indeed, he paused. Then he said how he was confused that a political position could be collapsed into a religious term. I should mention he's a Brit. Uh, uh, um, and that allowed me to, you know, indulge my pedantic nature and say that liberal religion is a term of art, which dates back several hundred years. Uh, uh, another term that overlaps in meaning is religious modernism, although that has, until fairly recently, usually been reserved for a specific movement within Catholicism and among a handful of Anglicans. Um, <clears throat> I launched into what, what, in you, you world is called an elevator speech about a liberal religion. Uh, the liberal of liberal religion has a this worldly and rationalist bias as it engages ancient traditions that we've received as our religions. Now, <clears throat> I'm a, perhaps enriching the term here, but also, and this is, I think, important, equally important to that naturalistic bias. Um, uh, at least in the sense I use it, liberal religion implicitly embraces intuitive insights as equally valid ways of knowing. In in the Unitarian Universalist world, this this traces back to transcendentalism, and uh, I'll just leave that there. Uh, 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 it, it, it it's a rabbit hole I could really really 
follow through it. You know, maybe somebody will want to do it later. <clears throat> but um, all of this is kind of in the sense of postmodern or post postmodern. I, I get confused about about these terms. Um, <clears throat> for me, at least, liberal religion encompasses a full on embrace of wonder and a suspicion of any reductionist assertions. This, of course, places my spirituality at a somewhat different point on the line of modernist Buddhisms. The priest himself, he grumbled a bit about Protestants, uh, but mostly in a good spirit, I thought. Uh, I decided at the time it would probably be too complicated to add in that I don't actually consider myself a Protestant, but uh, uh, that allowed us to move on to other things. Here, just a tiny bit more unpacking about that line of modernist Buddhisms. First, modernism and liberal religion. I think a great deal of the attention given to modernist approaches to Buddhism specifically has been toward the adaptation of Buddhist practices and to a lesser degree Buddhist principles into contemporary secular culture. And that's certainly a worthy subject. I would add the full range of what might be encompassed in the term modernist Buddhism or Buddhist modernism does include what I'm call, calling liberal religion. If full on orthodoxy is to the right, I, I get stage right, <laughs> stage right. Uh, um, uh, 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 if orthodoxy is to the right of a continuum and secular Buddhism is to the far left, I suggest liberal Buddhism as an expression of liberal religion fits somewhere in the middle. Uh, looking at what is occurring is another worthy subject. Liberal religion arises within the European Enlightenment. The term stands for currents within Christianity. Liberal religion, however, also exists in Judaism and Islam. It has influenced many Eastern religions. Most of all, it has touched Zen and some Pure Land traditions, especially in their Japanese forms. And I will resist launching into a little history of Meiji and the and the Unitarian and Buddhist uh, connections in that in that formative and rich period. I believe liberal religion is more a style or approach to religion than anything else. It has identifiable characteristics. The approach is broadly this worldly, rationally inclined, has a naturalistic, usually monistic mystical side, is broadly universalist and sometimes syncretistic. As such, maybe the idea of a continuum doesn't actually quite work. Where liberal Buddhism might represent, as I said a bit ago, postmodern or even post postmodern modernism. I find this liberal perspective a current, not unlike Gnosticism in the ancient Near East or Tantra in the ancient Indian subcontinent. It can exist by itself, as it does in contemporary Unitarian Universalism, where religious liberalism is not attached to a specific tradition. Mostly, it incorporates as a particular approach within a larger spiritual tradition, like the liberalism of contemporary Anglicanism, or what we often find in the United Church of Christ, the UCC, sometimes jokingly called Unitarians Considering Christ. And it can and is becoming a school of Buddhism, or more properly, it appears to inform several emerging schools of Buddhism. It's also important to note how liberal religion really annoys a lot of people from several different angles. So-called true believers, those who hold fundamentalist or simply exclusivist views of their religion, despise religious liberals. Heretics, after all, are pretty much always hated more than infidels. And interestingly, the contemporary atheist community, at least at its polemical end, usually do not like religious liberals either. Probably as the balance of their arguments against religion are based upon the most fundamentalist versions of particular faiths. No one likes their straw man arguments complicated by nuance. They will even go so far as to assert with the fundamentalists how liberal versions of a given religion are not the true versions. 
irony dancing with irony. So how does this come together for me and maybe for us? We seem to have within the structures of our brains an ability to see things at the same time. One, that we are different and distinct and acting in our own interest. And two, we exist within an intimacy so profound, it is fair to call it one. Although I think in some ways that one is one too many. The play of existence is more complicated than even that most lovely of reductions. Over the last couple of years, I found a shifting in my interior life. As a Zen practitioner, I've been focused for many years on the profound and subtle pointing expressed succinctly within the Heart Sutra. Form is emptiness, emptiness is form. It is an approach to that religious perspective generally tagged as non-dual. And I believe it contains the great secret of our lives, our past, our future. Within Zen, we find a perspective somewhat different than in other non-dual traditions. And we find it within that expression of an exact identity of form and emptiness of our lives in this world and some profoundly inseparable, wild, and ultimately unnameable openness. This. I found is enormously important. Fronting these twin truths has been the project of my life. My principal tools have been Zazen, just sitting, and koan introspection. Other things as well, especially in past and now recent years exploring the rhythms of life as a, as a Zen practitioner. And of course, there have been the eruptions of the heart that have further directed my life. Whether they're the product of those practices, I can't say, but they do feel connected. So that said, the shift. It comes out of something that is also captured within the Mahayana expression of the Buddhist way, the three bodies. The one is Nirmanakaya, the realm of history and causality. Another is Dharmakaya, the realm of the absolute or vast emptiness. And the third is Sambhokakaya, the realm of miracle, or as I see it, the realm of dream and story. In this third place, the absolute and the phenomenal meet, and there are eruptions, perhaps disruptions of time and space, but absolutely disruptions of our sense of what is. For me, those disruptions manifest as a decentering, decentering of my ego the sense of self I call me. My practices and companions for these many years have opened this third place, and it is increasingly where I'm finding I live. Sambhogakaya is the decentered place. It is the post or even the post post of modernist Buddhisms and an invitation into the mysteries of the holy. Not crushing or destroying our egos, an impossible task without also killing the body. Instead, decentering, decentering my ego, allowing that impermanent product of causes and conditions, its existence in the moment, and its importance, its place without trying to hold on to any moment of it as it goes about its business, encounter, rising, and of course, falling. I practice as a Zen Buddhist, if perhaps of a liberal and rational sort. And I find much of my inner experience is populated by the stuff of Christianity. More than I would have thought given well how I understand the world. And yes, there is that rational thing too. This is my little corner of the great buzz that is the world and my heart in motion. All of it experienced as I experience it. With this... <laughs> Back to that mass in the little Episcopal chapel in West Cornwall, on the eastern side of the North American continent, on a small planet spinning around a middling star at the edge of one of a million, million galaxies. As the service worked its way through the story of Jesus and his disciples gathered at their meal, finally the consecrated bread and wine were offered to all who were present. Me, I've been to many Episcopal services over the years, 
Episcopalians are without a doubt my favorite Christians, but I never take communion. As lovely as that tradition is, I always felt just enough of a separation that partaking in that most intimate part of the service never felt appropriate. Not respectful, not, not right. This time was different. And maybe in some degree it was my relationship with the priest, but that hardly would be enough. Something else happened in that little stone chapel. I saw, I noticed the whole universe was present. All the angels of Western faith and all the devas of the East were present and circling around that little altar that somehow became the navel of the cosmos. And without thinking about it, without worry about theology or proper decorum, without any concern, but a longing to come ever closer to the moment of creation, I stepped into that small circle and I received communion. Now, this is not the only time I've had such a sense of invitation. I can offer a number of examples, but I'm a, a Zen teacher. So when we retired, Jan and I, uh, and returned home to Southern California, a mutual friend made sure I met a local Japanese Zen priest, the Reverend Gyoke Yokoyama. <coughs> he leads um, uh, 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 Japanese American congregations uh, at the time in Long Beach um, and now um, uh, Montebello, um, where he conducts services and preaches sermons and tends to the pastoral needs of the people he serves. As I noted, mostly Japanese Americans. In addition to his ministerial duties, he leads his Zen meditation group several mornings a week. Uh, sadly, few in the congregation are interested in meditation and his little group are actually mostly converts, mostly in the moment, at least, uh, of European descent. And while I'm responsible for my own sin groups, um, I love uh, uh, going in, in the mornings and, and sitting with him um, for several reasons. One, I'm not in charge. Uh, uh, I get to, as we say in the Zen way, just sit. Um, and over those uh, years, uh, I've come to love that early morning schedule. The way the light comes in from the darkness as we begin, the mix of smells, particularly the slight hint of mildew mixing with sandalwood incense that instantly returns me to my youth sitting in the old Berkeley Zendo where I first began my practice many, many years ago. It's delicious. But the main reason I'm doing this is that I have committed myself to trying to relearn the sacramental functions of a Soto Zen priest. Uh, I first learned them pushing on, actually, you know, somewhere between 50 and 60 years ago. Um, but after my time in the monastery, I ended up practicing with a koan teacher who was not a priest. Uh, and well, that part of my Zen life more or less fell away. In my dotage, I, um, I've indulged uh, a path of integration. And part of that was full, more fully understanding the priestly part of, of my, my, um, my Zen life. I found this in some ways just relearning to bow, uh, never a bad thing, not a bad thing for any of us. And so, um, you know, I have, you know, for a couple of years, uh, uh, figuratively at least put on the black robe of a novice priest, uh, sat a bit and then, uh, tried to master a bit of the liturgical ropes, uh, presented by a kind and generous teacher. Not all that long ago, I found myself standing near the altar as the sensei approached. Uh, the form is closely prescribed. Every motion has a thousand years of practice behind it, within it, as, as it. He walked up with his hands folded at his chest. As he stepped to the altar, he put his hands together palm to palm. He picked up a waiting st stick of incense and held it to his forehead, bowing slightly. And I realized in that moment as Gyoke offered that incense for the world as it was, was the same moment as when Mary held up the chalice in an offering for the world. The truth has always been there, hidden in plain sight, in between, in the midst, decentering and discovering our true heart. Just this. And with that, the healing of our hearts. And with that, 
the healing of the world. So that's what I shared at the time. And uh, uh, a few years have passed. Uh, I'm no longer uh, 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 sitting uh, in the morning with Gyoke. Uh, we're, we're friends. He's moved from Long Beach up to Montebello, and that's made it a, a little bit harder. I, I realized that the, the Zen Buddhist priestly practice is, you know, is, is not my heart practice. Uh, um, but it was rich. It is rich. It touches all this. Then I made this presentation. Uh, and, and as I said, you know, Dwayne uh, Bidwell, Ruben Abito, Miriam Levering were the other uh, presenters. And uh, if you don't know them, they're all, they're all very interesting scholars. Uh, uh, Catherine Cornwell, who specializes in Hindu Christian dialogue, but also has a, a significant presence in the Buddhist Christian dialogue. She, you know, watched us make our presentations. And she said of, of Dwayne and Miriam, you know, uh, you're just Christians who like Buddhism. Uh, uh, and then uh, she, she looked at Ruben and she said, I don't know what the fuck you are. And uh, uh, if you don't know, if you don't know Ruben, you need to know Ruben, uh, 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 one, one of the more, most interesting humans on the, on, on the great intimate way. Then she looked at me and she said, you're just a Buddhist who likes Christians. Yeah. And, <laughs> and I, I, I don't know what, what the truth is. Uh, uh, um, what I do know is that there is something in there, you know, that I tried to put my finger on, um, that, that even, you know, Buddhism and Zen Buddhism, the Mahayana, our practice, um, um, it's still a human construct and it's filled with, you know, we make mistakes. It's got things, but, 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 there is something I, I I absolutely feel tumbled into something uh, um, that 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 Buddha is that Zen Buddhism is maybe the closest to, which makes it in fact some ways more dangerous because uh, you know the closer we are to the truth, the more likely we are to be tr you know trapped by near enemies of the of the intimate. Um, but 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 for me, having my heart pulled in these other directions, especially, you know, the natal, my natal tradition and such as has allowed me to, to disentangle a little bit, uh, um, and to, you know, and to tumble a, a little bit more deeply into, into the, the, the intimate way it feels, it seems, um, uh, we've got what, another, you know, between half an hour and, uh, a bit longer if we, if we want. What do you all think? Anybody got a, you know, where, where's your approach to this, this great mess? What do you think we're, we're, we're embarked on? What do, where do you think we might best be going? I'd love to know. And uh, James, if I can help here a little bit with, uh, with questions, um, there are a few, uh, let's see, I think I can see everyone. I think we're all on one screen. So uh, if you know how to use your electronic hand, it's down under reactions and feel free to uh, raise your electronic hand or I can see you. So if you want to just do this and uh, and um, uh, unmute yourself, I'll, I'll call on you and uh, we're all friends here. I, I know a lot of people on screen here, so it's, it's lovely to see everybody. Um, uh, James made some, some self-deprecating comment about not having a brain. Uh, at the beginning of his talk, and I think he's completely proven himself to not be uh, quite so honest about that. <laughs> My brain hurts right now, so... <laughs> but don't feel intimidated. If you have a question or a comment or um, or something to add or a, an anecdote, please, let's, let's take a little time and we can chat here. This is really a compelling topic. Don't make me ask all the questions. <laughs> Uh, Julia, thank you for raising your electronic hand. Go ahead and unmute. Thanks, Julia. So uh, I'm 
deeply moved by this talk, uh, James, because um, I thought that I was experiencing something that I ought not to experience, and that is I love sitting with my statue of the Buddha, and I love ringing the bell at the Anglican church and joining in the services. Um, and part of this is because I want a Sangha, and I live remotely in northern Ontario. I did uh, bring some meditation to a church. Um, I didn't feel I wanted to teach. I simply wanted the stillness. And so there were four of us, and it dwindled to three, and it continued to dwindle. Um, I'm uh, raising my hand because I would like to know if um, the Society for Christian Buddhism um, is online, and I, if how do I look some more about this? Sure. So the Society for Christian Buddhist Studies is is an academic uh, uh, forum, um, and and uh, I suppose there's a sangha for academics. Uh, uh, it's it's probably not your your you know, what 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 would work for you, but but. Within the White Plum Dharma family, uh, Robert Kennedy is uh, uh, the the lineage founder of a fascinating Christian Zen uh, community. Um, Elaine, um, uh, well, Elaine McInnes, I think she's, she is in in Montreal, but I think she's like ninety percent retired because I think she is like 90. Um, but but um, Ellen Burks, who is down in, in Virginia, but she's, she's an author and she's... A, 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 actually, I just did a kind of a detailed review of her, her book, Embracing the Inconceivable. Um, um, rich, delicious stuff. And, and um, A, the book, and then B, you might be in touch with her about... Um, just as an entry point to the Christian Buddhist communities within the White Plum, just within the White Plum. Um, mm -hmm. um, um, uh, and there are a number of them. I don't know that there's one in, in uh, but there are sitting groups that are in your time zone uh, that, 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 that um, um, touch the, the two traditions. Uh, so... If Thank that, you so much. That's useful. B I R X, Ellen. And if you go into the White Plum, I think there are links at the website for for each of the teachers, and she's a teacher within the within your your Dharma family. Ellen Burks is who you're referring to. I Thank am. You. Yeah, B I R X, E L. Thanks. Thank you, Julia. Um, uh, Joseph, you have your hand up. Joseph Farley, you have your hand up. Joseph. Hi, James. I really liked your representation, uh, your description of the Sambhogakaya as sort of this liminal realm where the ego is decentered. And I, I think that's. It, it sort of reflects, I think, a dimension of, of Buddhism that a lot of American Buddhists, especially American Buddhists associated with Zen or maybe even Theravadan traditions, um, there's, there's kind of a, a lack there for us. Um, you know, I can speak for myself, and I think it reflects a lot of people's experience. People turn to Buddhism, especially traditions like Zen in this country and in Europe, um, because they have God issues. <laughs> you know, we've dealt with the dysfunction of a lot of Western religions. And... Um, you know, cultivating the heart-opening qualities of devotion 
don't come easily to us. And even in traditions that are rich in, with that, like the Tibetan tradition, we can't necessarily just step into that. I practiced with a Tibetan teacher for um, several years and tried to cultivate devotion, and it all just seemed a bit too cartoonish to me. Um, I found over time, um, I felt a need to decenter my ego. You know, I got really, really, my, my efforts to become enlightened just sort of crashed and burned. You know, I, I say that's when I became a failed. <laughs> My Buddhism crashed and burned. And I found myself drawn to some of the very oldest mystical traditions in Christianity, to uh, mostly Eastern Orthodox, and um, became involved with the Orthodox Church for a while and practiced the Jesus prayer, mostly on my own. And, you know, I just found... Jesus was somebody I could actually feel devotion for and cultivate that sense of ego decentering. Um, I was reading a book about Shin Buddhism recently, and um, the founder of Shin Buddhism talked about the foolish self who turns to Amitabha Buddha. And that kind of humility is part of cultivating that that dimension of the Sambhogakaya, um, if you would. So I'm just, and I, I found with the Christian contemplative tradition, at least for a while, allowed me to practice in that realm, to, to cultivate that. And, you know, I certainly found that I had my problems being in, in the Christian worldview. Um, the idea of, of a God being in charge and creating everything is really problematic. And um, I finally discovered process theology and realized it's really just another attempt to recreate um, the Buddhist view of causality. Um, so I've turned back to Zen practice. I still have a foot in Christianity. Um, <coughs> I still value the rituals of Christianity. Um, I go to a, a very, we go to a very creative church that has roots in the Eastern Orthodox tradition, but is part of the Episcopal Church. Um, and that dimension is what keeps drawing, keeps me coming to Christian ritual, is that sense of decentering the ego, decentering myself, humility in the face of the great mystery of our lives with community. Mm. So, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Joseph. Uh, James, do you have yeah. any, any comment on that? There are so many points of entry in there that yes. that, that and, and things that, but but I think for us, the, the, perhaps the one part that I, I would like to, from actually near the beginning was uh, <coughs> about the Samba uh, um, I think there's a, uh, somebody recently was trying to said, so you're, you're a secular Buddhist. And I said, you know, you know, there's no, I don't have a secular bone in my body. Uh, um, 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 and I was trying to, at the moment I was trying to, I was struggling with trying to find language for, for, for what, but this all works for me. And Sambo Kakaya, I think, is the, the the issue. If you look at the history of American Unitarian 
is um, uh, one of the fascinating things about it, and there's like, I believe it maps a parallel with our emerging Western Buddhisms, is that <coughs> the, the, that Unitarianism emerged as an enlightenment reaction to Calvinism. And it was extremely rational. Uh, um, the the new the early New England divines uh, William Ellery Channing and 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 um, um, Joseph Priestley and well, he's not a New Englander but but in that same moment in time um, they you know they, they you know the beginnings of science were happening rational analysis of things was it had this advantage that it tended to work and 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 um, they applied it to religion. And uh, they they actually emerged out of that, seeing that they, 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 their religion was was based upon uh, um, uh, salvation by character. That you know you 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 uh, in New England it was you followed the principles of Jesus. To enlightenment didn't have anything to do with you know salvation didn't have anything to do with uh, vicarious atonement. It had to do with emulating the life of Jesus, which for them turned out to be uh, identical with being a New England gentleman. But but that's that's, that's uh, <laughs> how we read things. Uh, but but. It was also very analytical, and the, the Unitarianism came about. The name was because that they were reading the scriptures critically, and they noticed that the only reference to the Trinity was a was was a medieval interpolation into one of the one text, and and they said if it was if it was that important, God would have been a little clearer on the subject, and they they simply rejected it. And so their religion was was kind of reductionist, very, very analytical, inclined to the material and not unlike the Buddhism, a lot of, you know, Stephen Batchelor, who I deeply admire, you know, and that whole school. But but its shadow is kind of reductionist and, and, and materialist. If people keep pushing it a little bit too hard in the in the in the early uh, in the middle of the 19th century, one generation after after the Unitarian school emerges in New England, um, there's a revolution within the the movement, and um, we know it as transcendentalism. Um, and you know, it's this enormous literary artistic flowering in New England was in fact a reaction to the bare. Uh, rationalism of the first generation of Unitarians. It was a religious. It was a religious movement. I think I intuit, at least in my life, you know, without extrapolating it into the rest of the world, my own path, which is pretty rationalist and very analytical. My, my you know, my saving the saving grace for me and Zen is that there's a practice. <laughs> you know, I keep throwing myself on the pillow, and yeah, and then there's there those pesky koans. Um, and, and it's not a bare rationalism, it's magic, you know, um, the world is alive, you know, it's, it's, you know, and, and, and that's what we begin to look at, you know, things like, you know, uh, for me, if I was raised a fundamentalist Baptist, you know, but the, you know, the, I have arrived at the point where I see some wisdom in all the world's religions, except the Baptists. Um, um, and yeah, you know, and yeah, so I still have a little bit of work to do, uh, but, but, um, <clears throat> it is, you know, uh, Joseph, where you, you talk about the, the, you know, the Jesus prayer, an amazing spiritual discipline, uh, well, well worth knowing more about, especially for people interested in comparative spiritual disciplines. Um, all of that is there, uh, um, <clears throat> and, I, you know, I don't know. I think you're right when you talked about, and I'll stop with the, this the one last little thing. Where it's real hard, you know. I mean, there's all sorts of cultural problems around, you know, how we read each other's cultures. Uh, but I lived in New England for you know 15 years, I served two Unitarian churches there, and loved our New England lives. But we're native Californians, Jen and I both. I never could. St stop feeling that I was in Disneyland. Uh, uh, I'd tell this to my New England friends and they thought it was the f somebody from California that was the funniest thing, you know, because 
I lived in Disneyland. I came from Disneyland. But but what what I meant by that that thing was not disrespect meant to be disrespectful. It was just that the New England countryside, the the, the it just you know, it wasn't, it wasn't home. You know, it was, you know, back in when Mitt Romney was running for president, one of the, the thing that was commonly made as a gaffe was he talked about being back in, in, uh, um, um, Michigan, uh, was, uh, uh, that the trees were all the right size. Yeah. And, and, uh, you know, I mean, he was not my guy, but but that was not a mistake. You know that he was talking about. You know, the dirt fit right. You know the you know the thing was it was his deep roots. Uh, 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 even he was running as former governor of Massachusetts, but that. Uh, um, you know, out here, you know, back in California, and the dirt's right. You know, uh, uh, our mystical tradition in this liminal time. You know. I think Buddhism's right, but my content and my dreams, you know, it's Jesus, you know, and many of us are in the same boat. Thanks, James. John, you have uh, patiently had your, your electronic hand up for a while. Do you want to unmute and share, please? Thanks, John. Sure. Uh, it didn't really require much patience as the remarks from Joseph and James were so uh, deeply rich and and deeply felt and, and personal. So it was immensely rewarding. Um, I'm a, I would be quali uh, qualified by Catherine as weird too. Uh, I am a Anglican priest recently ordained in uh, uh, Victoria, British Columbia. So with Julia, I share partly uh, life in Canada, but I uh, teach theology and world religions here at Union Theological Seminary. Um, and write a lot about uh, and teach about multiple religious belonging um, or double belonging. Uh, a number of my students now identify that way and would not characterize themselves either as Buddhist or Christians or Jewish and Buddhist. It, you know, it would be both. Um, so I, I think, James, you're on the you're on the cutting edge of of a, a mode of religious life that many people are now explicitly claiming ditto with uh, ditto with Joseph and, and Julia. So I, I feel like I'm in, uh, in, in kindred company here. My, my question slash musing is that, you know, uh, I, I would say that I'm a multiple religious participant. I, I, uh, consider myself a student of John McCransky, who teaches out of a particular Tibetan Buddhist lineage, Nyingma. Um, but I haven't taken bodhisattva vows, and so I do not say I'm a belonger, but a participant, as I take up a particular practice while remaining grounded within my Christian uh, home. Um, you, I, James, I don't think you would call yourself either a double a uh, participant or uh, a multiple religious participant. I think you 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 were correctly, I think, diagnosed <laughs> by Catherine as a Buddhist who loves Christians. Um, but I I think what I find compelling about what you've articulated is that our our religious vocabularies are so deeply formed by the primary traditions into which we were birthed and learn to, as you say, dream, that without some reclamation of the imaginative symbolic network of our primary homes, I, I, I feel like there's always going to be something that feels missing. Um, I, I don't know if that rings true to you. I don't know that this is necessary for all, but my own experience is that when that work hasn't been done, there's a reactivity that's always present in the way you navigate your chosen tradition. That is, your Buddhism always has a, an edge to it because it's reacting against uh, what was wounding or what was alienating from one's home tradition. And without doing that repair work, 
uh, and which I think is what you're saying you're you have successfully done there there's there's something missing does that does that sound like uh, a viable claim or am I overreaching uh, given the vast variety of human beings and their experiences I, you know from from my perspective I, th I think you're right also we're we're at Buddhism in the West uh, is is it is in a transitionary you know is is a transitional thing itself uh, and you know, where the majority of, of participants uh, um, um, well actually I don't know what the gross numbers are from immigrant populations and such but but among those of us who seem to be mostly on this on, on these screens where we are uh, converts and um, so we are in fact bringing you know we're formed elsewhere and then for various reasons we've we've embraced this path again you see a, a parallel pattern in unitarian universalism where um, um, it's often it's the church for people who got mad at christianity and 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 so um, you know a lot of people you know the, the recovering catholic recovering protestant you know is an, an on um, immigrant yeah vastly outnumber uh, Sixty-seven percent of Buddhists are uh, are are from probably immigrant and descendants of immigrants. You know, birthright birthright uh, Buddhists. Um, a whole additional conversation about the fact that we have these two parallel traditions, and that we didn't, you know, that and that that I was ignorant of that number, um, but but uh, um, speaks to uh, another wound that we you know, that that we we have in our. Uh, um, in in both the Dharma family and in just our human family as well, um, that we you know that we uh, um, we birds of a feather things uh, and 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 what does that mean? Um, I think just speaking personally from my own path, it, it, and there is one thing out of that is that. I, I, John, I have to do what John, you, how you described it. I mean, for me, it's critical in my dotage. You know, as I, I'm 74, um, uh, I spent 50 years as a Zen practitioner, um, um, 55 years actually, and 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 at this point in my own quest for wholeness, there needs to be some. I need to invite in the 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 you know the Christian part. Yeah, I I attend occasional. Christian services and things, and there's not, you know, as yeah, you know, as my my friends who observe say, yeah, I, I may not be a good Buddhist, but I'm a Buddhist. Yeah, uh, my the the principles upon which I see the universe fit that way. The gift I think that's out of my personal struggle and many of our personal struggles is that there's also an invitation to see: is there a meta truth? You know, is there some, some? You know, is there a kind of perennialism? Is there a kind of universalism uh, um, that that one can find across these wild? You know, any intellectually honest and in that look at religion sees they're they're different. You know, my my grand teacher Robert Aiken, you know, uh, said, you know, we're not following different paths up the same mountain. There are a million different mountains, um, um, and and you know, um, um, I find I begin to notice. Well, there are these little things. You know, the word non-dual, while it comes out of Buddhism and Hinduism, um, um, you can find once you click to it you can find it in christianity and islam and uh in, you know well it is a hindu term a buddhist term but um um what is that and how can we intellectually and spiritually with integrity approach these things and i'm i'm, I'm deeply interested in that right now so, so thank you thank you john thank you thank you james uh roger daigo you have your your hand up hi from Oaxaca. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm sorry. I was muted again. <clears throat> I um, I want to say some things. I'm not sure I have a question. I think I might, but um, I can be absolutely sure that I'm going to uh, aggravate some people here in this room. I, um, I feel, uh, not to be disrespectful, but um, my thought is I feel very much like I am a a pork chop in a synagogue. 
Um, um, I've spent, I'm 75 and I've spent um, 40 of those years in Boston and um, know Unitarianism pretty well. I studied uh, religion and theology for six years and, and spent nothing but reading. And the bulk of my life has been spent thinking about great thoughts that are all encapsulated in everything that's being said. I find inherent contradictions between the two words, spiritual and religious. They are two words. We have two words because they mean, they mean two different things. Spiritual to me is the bigger word. It's the umbrella word. And religion, there are about 168 of them, all fit under the umbrella called religion, I mean, under spirituality. And the kind of thing that's been talked about here, rationalism, Unitarianism, and other kinds of things that have been discussed are particular religions that a person elects or chooses to believe in to explain the thing that is unexplainable. But by, by definition, rational approaches to the understanding of spirituality fail. Greater men than I over 3,000 years have tried to figure that out. And if um, some of the great mystics, um, some of the great uh, Renaissance thinkers, some of the great um, uh, theologians can't actually prove that there is anything to any of the religions except belief. And because of that, I struggled for a long time with trying to make sense of how to live your life in a meaningful, productive way. I knew of Buddhism. I knew of Zen um, way back when and decided about 15 years ago that it encapsulated this because for me, it solved a problem that I thought believing in a specific religion causes. It's what Thich Nhat Hanh calls, you can't posit the left without also positing or thinking about the right. You can't think of up without thinking down. You can't think of God without thinking of no God. You can't think of Jesus without thinking of no Jesus. So that these things, when you're thinking about them, they just become arguments. It becomes ways to pigeonhole people into the great quest that we all have, which is to try to figure out what life is like on this particular planet. And for me, people suffer because of this. I think it's the first noble truth. I think that when we become attached, like in the second noble truth, to a specific religion, or even the quest for an explanation, a rational explanation for God, when we, when we, when we actually go through the process of trying to understand the understand the misunderstood, when we try to do that, we suffer. People suffer enormously, and some of that suffering turns into death. It turns into abuse and, and, and all kinds of things that people feed when they attach themselves to a specific thing called religion or any particular one. So I'm going to be labeled an atheist or an agnostic by some. I'm going to be, you know, by, the, by Unitarians. We used to, in Boston, we used to call Unitarianism Christianity light. Um, and, and, you know, with these things to me, are incompatible with the true belief and understanding that we have in the, in the practicality of Buddhism. Buddhism is, 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 is spiritual, but it is not religious in my understanding, my view. It means that there's suffering. There's, there's things that we feed as human beings that cause that because we're attached. And the answer, literally, is that there is hope through some other way of looking at this in the here and now. And that's the noble, you know, that noble path is not religious. It is spiritual. 
we can wrap our heads around spirituality, but I don't think um, 2,000 years of thinking about trying to prove that God exists or Jesus exists or Muhammad or others that prophesied this were existing, 2,000 years of that, 2,500 years of that has caused enormous suffering. And to me, there is, and I do not mean to offend anyone by this, there is an inherent contradiction in believing in a religious God, monotheistic God, polytheistic God, and being Buddhist. There are tenets that we live by as Buddhists, I believe, that are at odds, if at best, at odds with the tenets, the beliefs, the sacraments, the, the entire belief dogma of every single religion that exists. And I don't know how we can continue having one foot in heaven and one foot in hell. I, I don't understand how we can do that. Because when we bridge this as just human beings, we are ignoring what I am involved with, with peacemakers in the action that must come from an understanding of the noble, the noble truths and also the path that we need to take in order to relieve suffering. And I believe only in four things, right? And we all know them. Human beings are numberless, and, and, and I try to free them. And one of the things that I try to do is, is relieve people, relieve the thinking, that delusional thinking that is rampant. And um, that's an action that I try to do. I, I apologize for rambling in this, but I do mean that this is a very difficult process for me and other people, I think. Thank you very much. Thanks, Roger. James, there's a lot there to comment on. Uh, well, and, and uh, I, I appreciate the confessional nature of it. You know, I mean, we stand where we stand and and we have to, you know, uh, first see what we, you know, where we where we are. And, and, and I appreciate that. And 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 um, um, uh, it it actually triggers, and I don't want to, you know, I mean, you know, um, um, you're in a majority position, you know, uh, that 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 most people don't believe you can have, you can exist. Christians and Buddhists can't be the can't 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 live in the same body. Um, um, that's what most people believe. Um, so you know, um, I'm you know, I'm, I, I uh, uh, truth. Uh, um, and some of and then there and then there are these annoying people that are here. We are, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So so there's that too. Um, what I did want to touch on, you know, other than just acknowledging the confession and saying, well, you know, and here we are, um, is is that the religion spiritual thing? I've thought a lot about that, and 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 it is kind of intriguing because. In fact, while they're etymologically different, they, 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 you know, up until fairly recently, they were the same thing. Uh, but they are an attempt using the two different words, spiritual and religious, has been an attempt to unravel some stuff. And um, it, it, my, when I first noticed it, when people first started using it um, around me, um, it seemed pretty clear spiritual was all the good things in religion, and religion was everything else. And um, and therefore, I, I I found my natural reaction was to say, well, I'm religious but not spiritual. Uh, um, but what the what I thought was the really important part of that was that religion, in you know, religion as a as an item as an aspect of culture, you know, re religions are that part of culture that are concerned with meaning and purpose, and and most of that is about reinforcing specific cultural patterns um, and cultural identities. Uh, it is the place in which a culture dis, um, describes itself, defines itself, and describes who's in and who's out. And, and um, 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 
<clears throat> that's often a very ugly thing. It, it's not without value. I mean, uh, it, it, every culture has coherence, and and you know, and you know, and humans make culture. You know, it's a it's a human thing. But but a boatload of that is really ugly stuff, and um, um, and and the attempt in 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 our time to to by creating these two distinct terms is to 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 look for in the term spiritual what is the really important thing and 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 i love roger that you identified uh the bodhisattva vows is uh you know as the you know as as the the heart of the spiritual and i sure resonate with that i mean you know um, on my approach to how to do it might be a little different but 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 i'm totally totally with you about that um i think that is a wonderful uh um, expression of of that part of religion that is worth that is worth our lives and, and I, so I thank you for confessing that and, and sharing that part thank you very much thank you both and uh, I don't want to uh, pull rank here but I uh, uh, I, I want to just ins Rick I'm going to get to you but I, I, I'm going to be selfish here and insert my own comment because it, it feels timely uh, having been raised a Roman Catholic and went to Catholic school and which meant I went to went to church six days a week for about six years in the 50s and the 60s and then uh, being a practicing uh, Zen Buddhist since 1975 with years of koan practice I, the, 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 uh, James, I want to say the, the most intimate and profound piece of your talk that I took away wasn't words. It's these two images. I'm almost going to cry. It touched me so much. These two images, and I can relate to them both, of course, of being in a, in a Christian service in this little chapel and feeling the reality, the truth, the power, the oneness that is available in ritual, not in talking about or thinking about or believing in, but in doing. And, and whether that's raising the host or swinging the chalice with frankincense and myrrh in it or whatever else it might be, with no meaning attached whatsoever. And your, you know, revisiting Soto Zen priest ritual and incense to the forehead and every, every movement so prescribed. When I teach people how to move in the Zendo and I say we, cro we cross the threshold with our left foot, they say, why? <laughs> and I say, no particular reason. Just try doing it, and try to remember to do it that way. Uh, that that was the, that was the most profound thing that I, that I that I took from what you said. So thank you so much for that. And Rick, I apologize to you for for cutting in line. <laughs> the next time you attend a, a peacemaker event, uh, I'll 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 return the favor. So go ahead, Rick. Thank you. Uh, no problem at all. Thank you, Jeff. Um, yeah. The, uh, <coughs> at some point in my life, actually a long time ago, I, I kind of gave up on trying to be a Christian and uh, kind of fell in with the Zen Buddhists and, you know, they're, they're, the, uh, one of the first things uh that was made clear to me from the, the tradition that I was in was uh, one of the teachers uh, fairly often would say something to the effect is you can't ride two horses at the same time. And uh, the, you know, the meaning was clearly if you're, if you're going to come here, you know, you, uh, you have to, just drop all that other stuff. And uh, the practice being as powerful as it is, uh, it was, you know, easy to understand that uh, sitting and sitting and sitting and sitting is uh, 
even though you don't know what's happening, you know that something is happening. And, and so I did that. I followed the, and after a while though, I, I kind of like regressed and went back to my old ways, but only in a little bit, uh, through the guidance really of a, a, a couple of books. Um, one was called uh, A Life of Dialogue. It was a compilation of people, mostly Christian, some Jewish, writing testimonies to a Buddhist priest, Maso Abbe. Abbe. Oh, oh, one of my teachers. He's not a priest. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah he's a scholar, I guess, but um, for, for, wonderful. Forgive me for just a second. I'm an old man, and I have to step away for just a minute. I apologize to everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I won't say anything worth listening. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I, if you don't mind, I do want to wait for James to come back, if that's okay. Uh, mm. I will say, though, that, you know, in a way of background, I'm, uh, I've been – practicing Zen for 35 years and, and uh, kind of struggling my way through the koan curriculum. And uh, it's been a long time ago, but I also spent a, um, a career in the U.S. military. And uh, I have a kind of a firsthand look at how religions can really make life difficult for people around the world uh, and how our reactions to our religious differences, uh, you know, basically can be quite deadly all the way to genocide. Um, so trying to get beyond that is, is uh, or, or kind of live a life of, uh, understanding that that part of or that's part of the world we live in <laughs> <laughs> so getting back to the the two horses thing uh yeah. the uh the, the zen life of dialogue book was uh uh, maybe people are familiar with it, but it was, it was a lot of Christian scholars and theologians talking about their encounters with this man, Maso Abe. Um, then the other book was uh, more of a straight up philosophical screed uh, poem by called Religion and Nothingness by uh, Nishitani. Anyway, so that that was my trying to make sense out of how Buddhism, or especially Mahayana Buddhism, uh, meshed in with Christianity. And but it, that only made sense to a certain point, you know. And then we're we're all left hanging. And and I guess all I'm trying to say is that. Uh, the uh, you know there might be a million different mountains, but those mountains are little tiny bumps on a, on a galactic scale or universal scale, and and that we can come to certain we can come to a point where there simply aren't two horses. There's no. There's, and that can be in a church in New England or, or a, you know, at the altar raising the incense and um, or walking down the street or standing in the line at the grocery store or the, the uh, you know, we're, we're all we're all just humans you know, with that have to get up and go pee periodically. Yeah. <laughs> That's all. I, I, 
and there it is. I mean, I think um, I, I'm very sympathetic to the, uh, you know, the Dalai Lama says you can't put a, you know, a horse's head on a yak's body or a yak's head on a horse's body. I forget. Um, um, there, there are all sorts of wise people say you just can't do this. Um, and yet here we are. Uh, yeah. Um, and and it, two truths. Uh, <coughs> I, I mean, I, I think I could go even further in that regard that I think part of the, the thing with Buddhism, the Mahayana, the the uh, um, the four marks of existence, the three marks of existence and, and awakening, um, um, uh, uh, if we take them as creeds, we've we've all of a sudden made a mistake. And and yet they're the closest to the, the to, in my mind, in my observation and everything that I've read, they're the closest to to the speaking the truth that I've ever seen formulated in by human by, by human beings. And the very teachings tell me, you know, you know be careful. Uh, uh, you know, was it? There's a uh, a wonderful. I, you know, thanks to Thomas Merton. I'm very fond of the uh, the. The the verba sonorum the 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 teachings of the elders the desert fathers and mothers uh, of Egypt one of the one of the lines Merton caught in his own little little um, um, version of the uh, uh, of of the teachings of the desert fathers was that uh, I read the the book that said sell everything that you have and come follow me so I sold the book so. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, 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 for us, you know, I mean, you know, you know, to, you know, the, the, you know, the truth of impermanence is not, is not a thing to believe. It's, you know, something to experience, you know, and, 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 and I've seen, you know, how Christians do it, you know, and it's, you know, and, and, uh, you know, I'm, I, you know, it is my natal tradition. I, 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 uh, yeah, I mean, for me to say I'm a Christian requires so many, you know, as, as John pointed out, you know, I'm a, really a Buddhist who, uh, you know, loves Jesus. Uh, uh, um, and that, that's just where I'm, you know, it doesn't look like that's that as I, you know, as I have so few years in front of me, I don't have a whole lot of time to change my mind in a big way. Uh, uh, so it's not likely that I, that I can find a different perspective. Uh, I'm, although I hope, you know, I keep opening myself. I keep opening myself. Uh, um, uh, I would, I wish I had had it. There was, there was a, um, a, a, a science fiction novel uh, called The Incredible Shrinking Man. Um, they made a, uh, they made a, a pretty good movie out of it in the fifties or, or very early sixties. And, and, but the book, um, it, at the end, it, it, what the, the, the conceit of the story is that, that the, uh, uh, the protagonist, uh, is on a boat and he passes through some radioactive fog and then he starts shrinking and, um, um, it makes good movie, you know, because, you know, he, you know, he fights with us with an ant or, you know, you know, uh, as he shrinks, but the, the very concluding passage he keeps shrinking and he's like he's now tumbling into uh between atoms and uh um and the universe opens up you know it's uh, one of the more moving passages from uh you know, in my it, unencumbered by actually remembering the quote uh, uh uh an invitation into this just you know it's just you know it's mystery after mystery after mystery uh, and and that's what we're you know, and what everybody I thought, you know, comes comes back to as we kind of tumble in towards the end here is is what we're really being invited into is intimacy. You know, is is you know letting go of our ideas of what is supposed to be the necessary dualisms of any concept uh, um, to something that uh, for whatever reason our you know our brains are. are structured in a way that we can actually you know we can we we do not have to be trapped in our magical ability to analyze uh um we can surrender that let go of that bow out of that 
Um, and that's where I think you see it in the chalice. That's where you see it in the incense. Uh, um, that's where you see it uh, anytime we're actually, you know, you know, the kid yells and you give, give her an apple. Uh, um, um, that, you know, um, is the great saving. You know, it's, it's, it's an amazing gift. And the religions try to address it, you know, when they're, when they're on their best behavior. Yeah, the spiritual of the religions try to address that. Thank you, James. And uh, we're going to need to bring it to a close. Uh, but I can't. I can't do so, Rick, without uh, just one comment on something you said. You talked about your Zen teacher saying you're, you're going to have to let go of that Christian stuff if you're going to if you're going to do this practice. And it, it occurs to me that that's half the instruction. The other half the instruction is you have to let go of the Zen stuff too. <laughs> So right, right. There, it's not that there aren't two horses. There's no horse whatsoever. <laughs> there we go. So uh, uh, I, uh, to further, uh, uh, in in a different way, perhaps this conversation, I wanted to just do a program note. Three weeks from today, noon U.S. East Coast time, uh, I'm, uh, I'm I have a panel of three of my friends, who are all three uh, Episcopal priests. One of them is a Zen priest. One is a Jukai Zen practitioner. All three of them are Zen practitioners. And um, uh, we're just going to talk about this notion of dual belonging. You know, is it possible? How do you do it? What's Christian? What's Buddhist? And, and what does it mean to you? So please join us if you'd like. This is uh, November 17th, uh, 10 o'clock in my time zone. So that's noon U.S. East Coast. And free for everyone to join so uh, we hope to see you again there and james we did it we're right coming up on the bottom of the hour brilliantly done and this was a stimulating and wonderful conversation thanks everybody who stuck with us for the hour and a half and james we so appreciate you being our friend and our guest thank you and um everyone stay safe stay healthy and take care of yourselves and as we like to say Take care of someone else. We'll see you the next time.